um, get started. Okay. So, well, welcome to our second uh, session of our January series of Books of the Month. Um, we are very uh, pleased tonight to have both of the authors that uh, <clears throat> joined us last week uh, for presentations to be here tonight to share some of their uh, favorite nature books. And um, we have one of our stalwart people who comes to just about every one of these book club uh, meetings, Drina Nemus, and she always has a lot of books. And we have a new person with us tonight, Martha Swaggerty, and I'm hoping that she wants to share a couple of her favorite nature books as well. So um, without further ado, I am going to uh, <clears throat> introduce Carrie Green. And she was our author of a wonderful book of poetry. And it is called Studies of America's familiar birds, but the subjects of her poems are really need to be explored. And I would like anyone who's listening or with us tonight, if you haven't bought Carrie's book, um, it's a worthwhile addition to your library. So uh, Carrie, without further ado, how about if you start us off? Sure. Um... Glad to. Um, so I thought um, I would share some of the books that I used in um, researching S nests and eggs um, for my book. Um, and I, I mentioned last time I was really lucky to get a grant from the Kentucky Foundation for Women. And um, with some of that money, I, I bought um, some books for my home library. So, um, so in addition, of course, to Joy's book, America's Other Audubon, which of course I refer to a lot. Um, I, you know, some as being someone who, um, like much like Virginia, I have had never really studied birds before or been a bird watcher or anything like that. I needed to understand. Um, the nests and eggs and the birds myself. Um, so the first book I have is um, The Book of Eggs mm. by Mark E. Haber. And what is really cool about this book is it's a life-sized, um, mm. it shows the life-sized um, images of the eggs. Mm. Um, so I'll, I'll just, and you can see there's lots of, um, sticky notes in my copy. Um, oh, let's see. I'll find one of the, one of the notes, because that's probably, no, I don't think I wrote about that one. I'm not sure why that's, why that's sticky noted. Um, maybe I was just interested or thought about writing about them. Okay, here's one I know I wrote about, um, the black, black-capped chickadee. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see right here, this really teeny tiny image that is the actual size of the egg. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> and then this is, um, they, they enlarge it so you can kind of see the pattern of the eggs, um, which is also helpful. And um, there's, you know, lots of helpful information in here, a map of the range, and then there's a little bit of information about the bird as well. Um, so this was really helpful in getting, you know, a little bit of perspective on um, how big the eggs were and, and, and looking a little more closely at the patterns of the eggs. Any questions about this book? Joy, are you familiar with this book? I have that book. I requested it for Christmas last year. Oh, did you? <laughs> um, this book 
is called uh, Avian Architecture, How Birds Design, Engineer, and Build. And it's by Peter Goodfellow. Um, and this one, as the title suggests, really gets more into how the nests are built. Um, so it's divided. Um, the table of contents, uh, you probably can't see that, but it's divided into um, different types of nests, like um, scrape nests, holes and tunnels, platform nests, et cetera. So it really goes into detail about how the nests are built, and there are all these really helpful um, wow. diagrams about how the nests are built. Mm -hmm. um, and also, yeah, it's a great, it's great as far as visu visuals because there's just all kinds of images of the birds and the nests. Um, let me see if I can find. It, it doesn't go, there's like a couple of sample birds, you know, for each for each type of nest. Um, so there's an eagle for a platform nest. Um, and this one just really helps me understand the structures of the nests um, and how they were actually built. Um, and then the last two um, were um, more photography of the eggs and nests. So this one is called um, Egg and Nest. Um, the photographs in here are all by Rosamond Purcell. Um, and then there's some introductions and notes by Linnea S. Hall and Renee Corrado. And all of the, I think all of the nests uh, in this book are specimens from, yeah, the Western Foundation of Vertebrate Zoology in California. Um, and let me find some of the amazing pictures in here. Let's see. So there's just these big, really beautiful images of the nests, um, including some extinct birds like the passenger pigeon. I should have marked that, but there are, there were some specimens of the passenger pigeon. Some of the, there's also some images of bird specimens. Let's see if I can find some of those. Yeah, here's one like this. Um, and I also found this book really interesting because it talked about the history of egg collecting and bird specimen collecting, which um, that was one thing that I was really kind of shocked by when I started reading the text by Howard Jones is, um, you know, that they killed these birds and they, um, they um, you know, took the, obviously they took the nests with eggs in them, you know, and that the eggs were um, then um, emptied out um, so that they could have these specimens. And that's, of course, all stuff that we don't, that's illegal now that we don't do anymore. Um, but it's it's just in, an interesting thing to consider, you know, what was done um, in the name of um, science. And I mean, certainly, like, it's great that we have all of these specimens now that we we can't we can't access um, in the same way. Um, but yeah, this this was a really beautiful book, and there are some close-ups of the eggs as well. I think here's this is I think a red-winged blackbird. Um, 
So you can really see the patterns on the eggs. Um, and then the last one is kind of similar to that one. This one is called, um, just called Nests by Sharon Beals. And um, it also has, just has these really beautiful images of mm -hmm. the nests. Mm -hmm. um, and these are from various museums. Um, I think the Western um, Zoological Society was also represented and a couple of other museums. Um, has a little more information about the birds um, on the opposite page you can see there. Um, yeah, so they're just all, whether in an illustration as Virginia and Genevieve Jones did or in these photographs, they're just really fascinating. Um, to look at to how at how they're constructed and everything. Thanks, Carrie. That that was really a good uh, segue um, for you to uh, use the books that you use for your research for your book of poetry. Um, about nests and eggs. That's that, that's very interesting. Um, I wonder if maybe you would take a minute and um, and I know this is off the top of my head, but to me it's a question, and to you you have to form an answer. So it it may be. I'm sorry if I put you on the spot with this, but. I wonder, I'm pretty sure that between your uh, perusal of ne um, Nests and Eggs by uh, the Jones family and these more modern books that had photographs of nests, what, what would you say are the biggest differences um, and how do they compare as being usable for nest construction? If you could maybe have any ideas. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That is a hard. I <laughs> see. I thought it might be. I may ask Joy that question um, because I know she's probably seen. But I think that photographs, in a way, um, take that point in time where you get this is the nest at the moment where when I look at the nests in nests and eggs I see that they kind of like went with this is how it's built I know that one of those books that you told us looked like they showed more about how they're built but to me it's almost like the book of the 19th century is an art rendering of nests and eggs. And now we have these beautiful abil this ability to take really photographs that are just pristine and show them exactly as they are at a moment. And so I wonder, is our perspective changing? Uh, do we like both? I mean, what? maybe that's a, a fair question to you as to, you know, what qualities did you find in the Jones book and what qualities did you find in the books that you use for your research? That's probably a fairer question. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think one thing to keep in mind about these books is they're photographing specimens. So um, I think these nests are probably older than the nests that the Joneses were um, illustrating. So even though, yes, we think of a photograph as being more immediate, I think um, 
actually, it, it may be that the illustrations were more immediate. And they, I think they also, you know, probably enjoy maybe able to um, expand on this more. But I, I think maybe the illustrations were also more of, um, like what the average specimen would have looked like rather than just one specimen in particular. Joy, is that correct? I think that they um, they had lots of examples of, of most of the nests and they probably picked the one they thought was the most, <laughs> most attractive as a composition. And I know mm -hmm. that Howard dissected a lot of the nests so that he could, and then he, he categorized the, all the components what would be commonly found in a nest. So when I think about the Joneses' work, and I do photography all the time. I love photography. I'm very thankful we have that medium. But if I had to draw a nest and figure out where a twig was going, let alone mm -hmm. all those twigs, I mean, the kind of patience and thought mm -hmm. not to, and skill that, and hours and hours of labor that went mm -hmm. into the just the original drawing, and then they colored 50 copies. It was supposed to be 90, but they reduced it to 50 because they couldn't keep up. <laughs> so I don't know if I know how to answer your question, but I don't think of photography of nest as art. Bird, bird photography might be because if you really stick at it and get things birds doing things that are unusual you know what I'm saying not just a pose like a skin your typical pose of a bird I think photography of birds could be artistic maybe I haven't looked at enough nests but like you said they were specimens so they couldn't be in the field with something unexpected happening right <clears throat> put myself on mute that I mean you both answered uh, what I thought and uh, uh, joy if you want to look at some bird photos of uh, that could be art we have a few uh, photographers bird photographers that are members of WCAS and and friends of and they, I mean, the two that I'm thinking of, uh, Tumanchuk uh, Solarsic and uh, Tom Fishburn, I mean, they get these birds in flight or on their way to land. And they really, I mean, they, and, and if asked, they will say, sometimes you just have to be patient or in the right place at the right time. And also, uh, we're doing a virtual bird trip with one of our board members. She uh, chooses a nature preserve each month, and then people register to go. And they, they go for a day or maybe a series of days, and then they write down the species of birds they found. Some of them um, are becoming very good photographers, and then they have a meetup the next month and share their stories and uh, what kind of day it was and where they saw the most birds and, and like, share their photos. It's really becoming a very, very interesting part of uh, our library. And just as your uh, book presentations are in our library with the book club, theirs are with the virtual bird trips as well. So that's a good thing um, that I think that you both observed very well as to the difference in what they did in the 19th century that I too would say uh, bordered on art if was not art. And now with uh, they can do all of this research for specimens that may be old or could be, you know, in the moment. So anyway, Joy, um, you ready to give us your book? I guess I am. <laughs> I, I didn't think of it 
kind of visually, I I thought of uh, books that had an influence on me, on my life, and made a difference in in my life. And so um, the first one that I remembered that had a dramatic impact. I think I might have been about the age of nine when I read A Girl of the Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter. You d- you're not familiar with Jean Stratton Porter? Mm-mm. Oh. Well, um, she also wrote Homing with the Birds. She was a famous naturalist in her day from Indiana. She lived near what was called the Limberlost Swamp. She wrote novels, but they were based on her life, like most novels are. But the the story of the girl of the Limberlost was about Elnora Comstock, who lived, her mother didn't love her because when she was being born, her father was drowning in quicksand in the, in the Limberlost swamp. So she, she lived in this loveless home and her mother just wanted her to do farm work and, and said a lot of things to put her down all the time. And, uh, Elnora wanted to go to high school and she couldn't afford clothing and she couldn't afford books and she learned from a woman called the bird the bird woman who knew about the things that lived in the limber lost swamp she learned to collect ferns and then she found out and she sold them to people in town and she found out she could collect moth specimens and sell them for a lot of money and there was one particular moth called the emperor moth that if you could catch that and sell it, it could pay for your whole first year in college. And so she she um, battled with her conscience between the idea of collecting these beautiful things and mount, killing them and mounting them to sell. She paid her way through um, high school that way, and she actually got to go to college using that method. And um, at one point, her mother finally realized that she did love her daughter and wanted to help her get the emperor moth so she could go to college. But she didn't understand anything about the collecting process. So she she caught the moth and put it in a box where Elnora was hiding her specimens because she was afraid her mother would, wouldn't understand. And the moth, being alive flitted around and destroyed all the specimens. Oh. Oh. But um, Elnora would, realized her mother had learned to love her or overcome whatever that... Because someone told her, actually, someone told the mother that her husband actually was a philanderer and that she shouldn't be, you know, punishing her daughter. It's not like he was, you know, that perfect. And so somehow she got over it. So anyway, instead of um, letting her mother know what had happened to those priceless specimens, she went out and replaced them and and never mentioned it to her mother. It just had, it just was an awakening to me when I moved to Norton and was in nature for the first time. I just really felt touched and and like like a kindred spirit to to Elnora the way I did for Genevieve. Jones later in life. And then the next book that had a big impact on my life, I, after I got divorced and I was raising two children by myself, I had no college education. I had no skills. I ended up working in a machine shop at night on second shift, grinding, making precision cutting things on little steel cutting tools for hours and hours on end. And they let us read books as long as we checked our tolerances at a regular basis. And one of the first books I read in that mindless place was Charles Darwin's The Voyage of the Beagle. And I, I really was just enthralled by the whole idea of natural history. And I, I'd always been told that I wasn't smart in math or science, but what it meant to not be smart was that you didn't get A's and nothing but A's were acceptable. So I stuck with English and art because I could get A's there. But I was always passionate about science. And I figured out when I was an adult 
that I don't ha I don't have to worry about grades anymore. I can read any book I want to. And that was a nice introduction to natural history, and it was um, serendipity that I ended up working in the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, where I could pursue those interests all the time. So then another book, of course, you know, the book, the Joneses book had a great influence on me and getting to know how that family worked. I really wanted to know how a family that functions worked. And I figured that family had to. And so I read everything I could about the Jones family, starting with the book itself. And when the Smithsonian digitized it, I wore it on a thumb drive around my neck for the longest time just to think that I can have I have the whole book I have the whole book and then they, they put it on the internet and then of course I could download it on the computer and, and just read it until I knew everything that was in it and I really learned about individual birds I'd never seen before I had no idea they were even in Ohio because I didn't look up high enough <laughs> I was looking at eye level. And so one of the things that touched me about the Jones family was after um, after Genevieve died and they finished the book project, her father always wanted to write something too. And at the end of his life, he started um, working on a book. It ended up being The Squirrel Hunters of Ohio. I don't know if you could see it. But um, he wrote this book. The Squirrel Hunters were citizen soldiers that went to Cincinnati during the Civil War because they thought Cincinnati wasn't going to be attacked. But it ended up it, it, they didn't have to fight. The, the soldiers from the Confederacy went somewhere else. But um, while he was working on writing The Squirrel Hunters, Nelson Jones, he, he also wrote... Um, stories from the Iowa frontier because before he ended up in Ohio he set up his first practice in Iowa and that's where he meant to take his family when he had one but Virginia's father wouldn't let her go to the Wild West and so he ended up in Ohio in Circleville in a town where that was rampant with typhoid fever and various illnesses and I always wonder how many times did he wish he had never come back to Ohio and and uh, subjected his family to those illnesses? But he hand wrote true stories by Grandpa for his three little grandsons. He never really wrote anything about Genevieve. He could never bring himself to write anything about Genevieve. But his first little granddaughter died. Her, her name was Genevieve Estelle, too, and she died of polio before she was two. So he wrote about her death, and he had a much closer relationship with his other little grandchildren. And he had three little grandsons at the time he wrote True Stories by Grandpa. And one of the things that especially moved me from that book is he, his um, definition of what heaven would be. He said to his little grandchildren, if there is a great hereafter, such a place where the children of nature go, Grandpa hopes to be there also. If Grandpa had his choice of all lands, kingdoms, and countries, and could take possession fee simple, as lawyers say, forever, never get old, nor die, nor change his abode, he would take a land and country on which no human foot had ever made an imprint a country where no mortal ever was, nor would ever intrude, a country full of beasts and birds covered with deep, dense forests, open glades, and running brooks and rivers. Nothing has the fascinating attraction of an endless, unbroken forest. Cities with golden streets and crystal fountains fade to visions of the night, and the sameness tires while the everlasting beauty, variety, and sweetness of an internal everlasting forest is a place of an everlasting abode and the hopeful paradise. And then I had one more thing to read. Um, Genevieve's brother Howard did some writing too. 
and he presented at the end of his life a paper to the Wilson Ornithology Club when it met in Columbus and it was called Birds of My Boyhood and I was just going to read an excerpt from that. Of all the sports of the forest field or streams, hunting the rough grouse gave me the most enjoyment. The glory of the primitive woods on a crisp November morning after a day of drizzling rain had soaked the fallen leaves to silence, itself an inspiration, was enhanced and made more wonderful by the intelligent work of a trained pointer. I can still see in my dreams this rare dog. That was his dog, Greek. Following cautiously the scent of the roughed grouse over moss-laden logs, through treetops felled by the storm, down valley and up vale, of hazel brush and briar, never breaking a twig or making a noise, now stiffening for the point, quietly tiptoeing as a bird moves on another few yards, when quicker than thought would come the whir of the bird on the wing. It's sadder now than I can tell to lose the dear bird friends of my boyhood, to see them fall by the wayside one by one victims of the inexorable laws of fate. There remains one still cherished boyhood friend making an unequal fight for its country. Listen and you will hear him whistle occasionally, Bob White. What a flood of remembrances this whistle turns loose. It spells for me boyhood, sunny days and moonlit nights, frosty mornings, Youthful friends with horses, dogs, and guns. Cornfields with golden grain and orange pumpkins. Streams of limpid purity with grassy banks. Fine appetites and bulging lunch baskets. And finally, dinners at home with cherished friends, making merry while waiting for the smoking coil to broil over the hickory embers in the old fireplace. Then the buttered toast as hot as pie, and a glass of biting cider with which to drink to the health of all life, without even the thought of time or death. But with these pleasing recollections come thoughts of remorse. I could not do the like again. The savage in me was then predominant. Uh, that was a great excerpt. That was really had me going back to my <laughs> childhood with frosty mornings and cornfields and frosty pumpkins and all at all. Um, very thank you. You both uh, shared. I liked your pers I liked Carrie's perspective that she went into her research for her book. And I love your uh, interpretation of it, Joy, that, okay, what, what books have gone with me through my life that have made a difference? And so that, that's exactly what we like to do with this uh, hour is to, to share those things. And I've written all of these books down um, so they'll – be added to our book list, <laughs> and they'll be recommended by Carrie and Joy. So that's the way we usually do this. So, um, Martha, I'm just wondering, did you bring a couple of books, which does not matter. I, I'm glad you're here, whether you brought books to share or if you didn't. But if you did bring them, I would love it if you would share them. Well, I didn't realize that the format would be like this, but I made a quick trip to my bookshelf and pulled out <laughs> a couple that I could mention. Um, oh, good. My very favorite book, though, is the um, Studies of Familiar Birds by Carrie Green. Oh. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm her aunt. What can I say? <laughs> 
but I but I do think it's a wonderful book of poems. It is. It uh, I I pull it out regularly and and uh, go back over it. Um, I live in Florida, and um, the part of the state that I live in is um, on the coast, um, just a little bit east of Apalachicola. So I don't know if anyone's familiar with the area, but they often, you know, every Florida area has its own nickname, and this is called the Forgotten Coast. Um, it's very uh, sparsely populated. Um, we have 80% uh, of the county is public land. Um, the Apalachicola National Forest, the Tate Hill State Forest, and where my house is located, uh, right off the uh, I live on the water, and then right out there is is uh, a, a little spit of land that's called the Lanark Reef, which um, I've learned is a very important um, area for nesting birds and for for uh, rare and endangered nesting birds, and a really important area as a stopover for wintering and migratory birds. Um, I've you know, did some, you know, citizen science volunteering, which um, my interpretation of that is carrying the clipboard and um, was able to go with some real uh, excellent scientists and help count or write down what he counted. Um, some really rare birds, even um, things like the uh, piping plover and the snowy plover, birds that actually nest up in Manitoba, Canada and then come down here to Florida for the winter and stay right, you know, in my neighborhood. So I just was always fascinated by that. Um, as a result, one of my favorite books has actually been a reference book, and the title of it is Priceless Florida, and it's a book that is uh, published by uh, Pineapple Press in Sarasota, which Carrie will remember since she worked there for, for a little while, and the... Um, there are three authors, and they are all they're all uh, doctors: um, Ellie Whitney, Bruce Means, and Ann Rudlow. And um, it is the most fascinating uh, book because I have never had a, a reference book that was so complete. Um, and it's sort of uh, separated by the different kinds of uh, ecosystems that we have here in Florida, because of course we have everything from pine woods and pine uplands and pine wetlands and very not very far from my house you can go and actually see um, bogs where they have uh, carnivorous plants growing and um, so that's fascinating the interior wetlands coastal waters and um, coastal uplands so it's beautiful it's got gorgeous pictures um, it's the narrative is although I think it may be useful to scientists, I know it's useful and very interesting for non-scientists. So I may not understand the genus and the you know all of that stuff that goes, but I I do appreciate being able to look something up when I say I wonder what that is, and I always find it there. Um, the other I, it was interesting about the discussion about, about whether photography is art or not that the other book that I really love is a book of photography and the title of it is The Seasons of Apalachicola Bay and the, um, the photographer is a gentleman that lives here locally and his name is John B. Sporer S-P-O-H-R-E-R Jr. And um, we went to, when, when his book was first published, he had, you know, a public, um, uh, I, I guess, reading, but it wasn't, I mean, it's photography, so it was actually, you know, just more of he set up a gallery. And I have to say that all of the, all the photography in there is absolutely beautiful. He, um, uh, his uh, camera and lens um, are just awesome. But one of my favorite photographs that was in, I saw it, you know, in the uh, gallery the first time, but it was also in the book 
um, in the gallery it was a picture that was blown up to about two feet by three feet. Um, but it, the, um, it, it was so sharp that you could see the, there was a belted kingfisher with the reflection of the Apalachicola River and the horizon in his pupil. You know, he had that kind of um, uh, equipment and, and the uh, willingness to, as he said, be out laying on the beach on his belly at five o'clock in the morning to get the picture. So anyway, um, all of those pictures in that book are beautiful. So that's my contribution. Martha, yes, I know Apple. Oh, I can never say it, but uh, Apple, what Apple Chocola? Is that yes. it? Yeah. Yes. Apple. Okay, I have a good friend, um, Susan Miller, who grew up. She lives in Cleveland Heights in Ohio now, but she grew up there and uh, talks, I mean, loved it and, you know, still wishes to be there at times and mm -hmm. and says much about it what you said um just how beautiful it is and it's it is it's it's the forgotten coast and she always said she was glad it was <laughs> yes. yes yes and they keep forgetting that it's fine i mean we have right. uh, uh you know it's what they call the old florida and yeah. um i I worked as a docent at one of the local lighthouses and one of my favorite moments was a couple who came in and they were looking for a place to eat but they didn't want to eat at a chain and I said, no problem, we don't have any chains. <laughs> so, and, that, and that can be a good thing. You know? It can be, yes. Yeah, yeah, that is, um, thank you for those two books and I, I like that you said that about the book of photography of the uh, what was his name Spore John Spore yeah. yes. who who said you need to get out you know you need to be willing to get out there at 5 a.m. and wait for the photo and that that to me is when photography does reach art is when people are willing to sit for hours waiting for the the right light and the just the right thing and they that they know it because they've done it over and over and they are in a way perfectionist mm -hmm. yes so, yeah but then on the other hand um, it's even more wonderful when they have those kinds of photos happen and they weren't you know uh, planned or that they thought they could get it so that was really thank you Martha and I'm glad you ran to your bookshelf and found two books but yes this is the second session as always we ask our authors and um, then the others who came to the talk uh, the author speaker talk to come to this one and share their uh, books with us so um, actually uh, Drina we're going to end with you and um, yeah I think we will be ending with you but I did want to say a little blurb about what we're going to maybe have our books be next month uh, what I'd like to do with it but we'll see if that works uh, but Drina why don't you uh, take us off with the final act here um, you're on mute I so enjoy these evenings and I especially enjoyed last Sunday too and um, I I do have the book uh, that the Joneses put together and um, I have I'm keeping it out now so that I can look at it very frequently because it is so it is so beautiful it just it's worthy of looking at many 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 times so but um, I wanted to talk about two books tonight and one is that I got for a Christmas present and it's called um, The Handbook of Bird Families by Jonathan F. Flick and it's 
uh, about actually the taxonomic bird families. And um, it's been something I've been interested in as I've been trying to kind of get a grasp of this unbelievable topic of bird. And it's, um, it's helping me in some ways, but again, the field is so vast that um, it's, uh, I'll never I'll never be finished. <laughs> but the book is really quite beautiful too, with pictures of uh, especially illustrious birds of a certain family. There are 234 families, uh, and, and out of 36 orders of birds. So it's just as we all know, it's a gigantic part of uh, our natural world. Um, but it's taking me all over the world, and um, so I'm enjoying it immensely. And then I continue to read this book that I have brought up, I think, in our de December or our November meeting. Maybe I don't, I'm not sure if we met in December, but um, it's called The Cabaret of Plants by Richard Maybe. And um, I'm slowly making my way through it because uh, now that I'm retired, I have the time to really read a book um, thoroughly and thoughtfully and to look up things that I am unfamiliar with. And so every page has a different geography someplace in the world and different um, plants, birds, and so forth. So I'm doing a lot of research as I'm reading it. But I thought I'd share just a little bit about um, one of the chapters that um, I'm reading, it's a section about trees and the whole, there's, there are five or six chapters called The Cult of Trees. And uh, this chapter is on the baobab. And so I thought I'd read a little bit and you could see then um, like where Richard maybe is coming from as he writes. and. Uh, the title cabaret he's displaying he's talking he's going through a cabaret and introducing various um, plants of life so this is a little bit from um, the baobab the first trees to be regarded as prodigiously ancient by European explorers were the baobabs of Africa baobabs evolved on Madagascar which was cut off from mainland Africa more than a hundred million years ago and became a cauldron for the development of bizarre organisms. 90% of the island's plants and animals grow nowhere else on earth, lemurs most famously, but also three quarters of its 850 species of orchids. There are six aboriginal species of baobab here and all are adapted to living in the parched soils of the Madagascan savanna. They have waxy white flowers, which are pollinated by moths, bats, and even bush babies, which have been spotted eating the petals and playing with the powder puff stamens. To conserve water, they have evolved dwarfed crowns, short branches and leaves which drop early in the dry season. When the trees are young, these flat, four shortened top knots look like roots. A local myth explains this by suggesting that the primordial baobab was too beautiful for its own good. The gods turns it topsy-turvy as a punishment for vanity and for good measure endowed it with cumbersome portliness. But what chiefly keeps baobabs alive in the drought months are the paunches and elephantine buttresses that develop on mature trees. Their trunk wood is as soft and as absorbent as balsa and becomes a living cistern capable of storing thousands of gallons of water. At some point in the last 10 million years, the seeds of one of the ancestral baobab species, which are constituted in large buoyant pods, floated out across the Mozambique Channel and fetched up on the East African mainland. The seeds germinated and the resulting trees over millennia developed into a seventh species. Addisonia digitata proved to be the most adaptable and successful of the genus 
and soon spread across the continent, eventually helped on its way by local people who found it an inventive, accommodating, and adaptable companion. In 1832, in the early stages of his voyage on the Beagle, Charles Darwin was shown a great baobab on the Cape Verde Islands, 300 miles west of mainland Africa. It was reputed to be 6,000 years old, and Darwin carved his initials in it. But it was in mainland Africa that the baobab met its mammalian doppelganger. Al elephants, absent from Madagascar, homed in on these suggestively pachydermic invaders. They attacked them with a ferocity that seemed to go beyond the simple satisfaction of big appetites. They trashed them. They tore up whole branches, devoured the leaves, stripped the bark entirely from the lower part of the trunk to reach the moisture underneath, and often knocked the smallest trees flat. However, the baobab had already evolved adaptations to rough treatment in the bushfires of Madagascar. When damaged or stripped by whatever agency, the bark grows back, just as it does on stripped or burnt cork oaks. The fallen trees simply continue growing where they lie, building wooden boulders out of their wrecked trunks, pushing up new columns, snaking out new limbs parallel with the ground. One famous heap of a tree close to the Limpopo in South Africa is known locally as Slurpee, an affectionate reference to the Baobab's complex relationship with elephants, both as victim and mimic. So that's just a little bit of the flavor of the book, how he talks about so many things uh, about the plant, its history, how it works with the environment, how people interact with it or nature. And uh, very, it's very wonderful reading. That is, that was wonderful. It makes me, you know, one reason I like people to choose excerpts to read from their selections is I think that sometimes, um, I remember this, this is a, a fiction book, The Goldfinch, and I have a librarian friend who said, oh, you've got to read this book. It is just so wonderful. Well, that book was so difficult for me to get into that if I had picked it up on my own, I probably would have just said, no, I, I made a mistake. <laughs> but because she told me how wonderful it was, I just slogged through it, and then <laughs> it caught me, and I stayed with it. It was great. But so, like that expert excerpt that Drina just read or the one that Joy read, and Martha, they they just kind of, uh, they make me want to pick up that book and try it because mm -hmm. that sounds, they sound so interesting to me. Mm -hmm. So um, basically, I uh, think that's really great. And the only thing I wanted to do on the way out here, and I don't know if Joy and Carrie and Martha will be joining us again for one of our book discussions, but you are certainly more than welcome. Um, next month, Drina, and I think you've already got your book, <laughs> The Cabaret of Plants, I want to start exploring your Backyard Wildlife Garden. Mm -hmm. This book is put out by Rodell Press, mm -hmm. and it is a wealth of information. Um, it has excer it has native gardens from the Northeast, the Midwest, the Southeast, mm -hmm. the Southwest, and Northwest, and the Pacific Coast. So you get all of those kinds of here are native plants. Um, it has a whole sections on that, you know, one person's weed is someone mm -hmm. else's wildflower. Um, I, 
I thought it was really interesting in this book, they, they say that milk, common milkweed is a noxious weed where most of us who are native plant people would say, mm -hmm. uh, no, no, <laughs> they're very necessary for monarch butterflies. So it's, it's really interesting. And um, this is just one of the books that I'll bring, but I would like um, Drina to you to bring maybe not only cabaret of plants, but a couple of others. And then that's what I'm going to, I'm going to say for next. And I'm hoping that maybe if we've got a topic uh, that may uh, give us some more uh, people, the only problem is I, I don't like to structure it too much yeah. because our two authors, yes did exactly what I would like people to do is to take their own interpretation of what I mean and go with it because that's what I believe book discussion groups are for. So anyway, I want to thank you, Martha, thank you for coming from Florida <laughs> to be with us tonight. Um, thank you, Carrie and Joy and Drina and Betsy, who always records this uh, session for us and stays in the background pretty much. Someday, everybody, I'm going to get her to share some of her favorite nature books, too. But I just can't. Oh, she goes, I'll have one if you need it. But she goes, oh, you never need them. <laughs> so, anyway, thank you and good night. And I hope to see you all again. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, thank you.